My name is Julie Ann Link, and welcome to the Music Link. This week on the Let's Link project, I'd like to welcome Nicole Haywood. Thank you so much for being here, Nicole. Thanks for having me, Julie. So just to get started, could you please share with us an overview of what you do as a professional musician? My name is Nicole Haywood, and I play the bassoon. Um, since 2019, I've been acting assistant principal bassoon and second bassoon in the Oregon Symphony. And during the summer, I play assistant principal and second bassoon in the Grant Park Orchestra at the Grant Park Music Festival, which is a 10 week summer music festival in downtown Chicago. Cool. Could you share with us more about where you grew up? I am a born and raised Texan. I live in San Antonio, Texas all my life until I went to college and uh, wonderful band programs, a good music community, good Mexican food. Yes. <laughs> quite an amazing city. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So did you get introduced to music and the bassoon through the Texas band program? Yes, I did. Um, I don't come from a musical family at all. So I didn't even know what the bassoon was. When I was in elementary school, we had gone on field trips and I saw the orchestra, but I don't think I was paying too much attention at the time, to be honest. <laughs> but my brother played bass in orchestra. He's four years older than me. And I am the stubborn little sister and I wanted to do something different. So I wanted to join band. So when I was in fifth grade, entering sixth grade, we were able to go to the band hall and pick out our instruments. And so that's how I was introduced to the bassoon. I wanted to play trumpet or percussion, something cool, but I think I had terrible rhythm for percussion and I don't think <laughs> I could make a sound on the trumpet mouthpiece. So they put a vocal with a reed yes. in my mouth and I made a funny sound <laughs> on it, kind of that quacking crow noise. And I laughed and I remember thinking, okay, whatever, sure. And I started taking private lessons immediately. So I think that's kind of why I stuck with the bassoon because mm -hmm. I had a teacher from day one. And my woodwind teachers in just my middle school band knew what they were doing. So mm -hmm. I think that was helpful. That's so cool. I love thinking of just the band director just like giving you this vocal and the read. Yeah. <laughs> like, go for it. <laughs> and I remember going home, I think Google had just become a thing. And I remember going home and my family, we sat on the couch and we Googled the bassoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I had no idea what is this thing and I guess I'm playing it now. But I've always been kind of adventurous and go with the flow like sure. So that's what happened. Do you share with us more about where you went to school? Yes, yes. So getting into music was a, I think I took a strange path. So when I left high school, I had decided that I was going to be a petroleum engineer and that I was going to pick the practical career. I always loved math and science and I was in physics class and chemistry class and my grandfather was a geologist and I always kind of loved rocks. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to do practical things. So when I was 18, I moved to Golden, Colorado and I went to the Colorado School of Mines and I was miserable there. I think that was when I finally realized that I needed to be playing the bassoon. And so I basically just called home every day, like a lot of tears happened. I actually remember, I have so many memories, I moved up there in the summer and I would drive out to Vail, Colorado, and I would see the Philadelphia Orchestra play in the summer and Dallas Symphony and the New York Philharmonic was there. I remember hearing Tchaikovsky 4 and just then driving back to Golden in the middle of the night. And, oh my gosh, I, I, that was, I think I needed that life experience to realize that I had to be playing the bassoon. So it was such a weird transition to get there. So I, um, when I was miserable in Colorado, I emailed Kristen Wolf Jensen at the University of Texas at Austin. And of course I'm from San Antonio. So I realized I needed to be closer to home and my brother was at UT at the time and I had no clue what I wanted to do, but I figured it was 
gonna be related to the bassoon, but it seemed like such a far-fetched dream. So I ended up transferring to the University of Texas at Austin, which is an amazing school. So in my mind, if I didn't want to play the bassoon, there were so many other degrees I could do. But what I kind of did was I just, I emailed Kristen and was like, hey, remember me, the high schooler that said they weren't going to go into music? And, <laughs> and I emailed her and I had auditioned and I just dove headfirst into the soon at UT. I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but so I ended up at UT for my bassoon, for my bachelor's in bassoon performance, and I was at Rice University for my master's, and I would say both schools were pretty rigorous. Um, the Uni University of Texas spent a lot of time in band, but also time in orchestra and new music ensemble, the opera orchestra, so much chamber music happening. I remember and studio classes and read class and oh my gosh, oral skills and music history, music theory. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I had to spend a lot of time developing my ear because I had certainly in high school not even been thinking about things like that. So that was a huge adjustment, but I would say both schools had a really kind of tight knit studio vibe, you know, it was, it was good vibes and definitely like my friends there have now become colleagues and part of just my network of people I can reach out to. It would be great to hear more about your teachers and how they influenced you. Yes. So when I was in middle school, I studied with Mark Rogers, who is a local bassoonist in San Antonio. He is also kind of a famous arranger when it comes to marches and orchestral pieces, arranging them for band, and he's a conductor. And he's who I studied with my entire young bassoon life. And, you know, we just did scales. We kept it fun. You know, we plowed through the Bisonborn and you know, we did solos, and of course, I was just a middle school, high schooler not looking to go into the bassoon, so my lessons were fun, and I still learned a lot and was held in a high standard, and I think because of those lessons, it set me up with a really good foundation going into UT, where I studied with Kristen Wolf Jensen, and she, um, she was really essential in teaching me how to practice what even is a fundamental, you know, what a scale, long tone, and she, Kristen, was just empowering, I would say. That's one word that comes to mind when I think of her. You know, she certainly empowered young, young me. And then after Kristen, I actually, I went to Rice after the University of Texas, but I didn't get into Rice the first time I auditioned. So in between UT and Rice, I moved back to San Antonio with my parents and I studied with Sharon Custer, who's principal bassoon of the symphony there. And so during my gap year, as I call it, I took lessons with Sharon. It seems like every week, I probably didn't actually take lessons every week, but I was pretty regular and we did just tons of etudes. We um, really refined my read making. Kristen did a great job of just teaching me the fundamentals of how to even make a read because since I was a high schooler not taking the bassoon seriously, the first time I made a read was at UT. And so Sharon, she had studied with Norman Hertzberg for her education and I was making reads with the Hertzberg shape and in the style and Sharon was really able to refine my reads and get them to a place where I could sing and, you know, do what I wanted to do on the bassoon. And then after Sharon, I went to Rice and studied with Ben Caymans and that was where I I feel like a big hump for me at Rice was learning how to consistently play well all of the time. You know, because I could go in there and play well and then the next week <laughs> be a total dumpster fire. So that was, <laughs> I, you know, so we refined my read making and studying. Um, ben is certified in the Alexander Technique. So spending a lot of time with the Alexander Technique and mindfulness, actually things that you would say that's not related to the bassoon, but it's so related to the bassoon and performing. And I think 
that whole mixture of things combined with just a ton of etudes and someone just demanding excellence from you every week. That's, uh, I think, what really kind of makes them the magic happen, you know? Mm. But I've been really lucky to have teachers that, you know, very supportive, empowering, healthy educators, always drawing knowledge from within you. They didn't beat me down, you know? Um, everything was kind of just the facts, you know, when things are sharp, when things are late, when things are not, uh, you know, when things are not good, it was always <laughs> not a personal attack, but just, uh, hey, how can we make this better? And I think I try and teach that way. Nicole, could you share with us any tips or advice about the music industry that you've learned since working professionally? Yes, I, I'm in Chicago right now. We're at my summer job in the Grant Park Music Festival, and that was my first job out of school. And again, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And one of the first lessons I feel like I had to learn very fast was that I was not going to play perfect every concert because we have 30 concerts over a 10 week period and two different programs a week. So 20 separate classics programs, basically. And I just remember in the first week on the job realizing like, oh, you know, I might play in a hole, like a big <laughs> giant rest or something, or I might miss this or, you know, and we're outside. So there's also that factor, but that was a big, and it's a lesson I'm still learning because I feel like we spend so much time in school like being like, I'm going to be perfect. I'm going to nail this, but in reality, and it's fine. A perfect concert isn't the best concert. Also, right. so that was a big, a very big lesson. And then just being a good person because you want to be surrounded by good colleagues. So be who you want to be surrounded by. Great advice, Nicole. Could you tell us more about your teaching career and your passion for outreach? Yes, so my teaching, I have a small private bassoon studio in Portland, and I also teach at Lewis and Clark College. I've done occasional master classes, three class at UT or youth orchestra classes. And even though that sounds like a lot of teaching things, I feel like teaching isn't as big a part of my life as I want it to be mm -hmm. because the orchestra schedule is so busy. Yes. And I'm acting assistant principal in Oregon. So I'm on one year, I've been on one year contract. So I'm still spending a lot of time doing audition preparation, kind of um, being selfish in my time so that I can get a tenure track job. So I eventually, I want it to be a larger part of my life because I do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I, especially when, Students are so hardworking and, and then outreach, outreach, love outreach. In Kansas City, we did a lot of concerts either at retirement facilities and then in Oregon, working with the music therapist at a facility for dementia patients. And being able to work with a music therapist kind of took that outreach experience to the next level for me, where it seemed more effective than just going to a retirement facility and playing, but then actually being able to work with a music therapist. And so challenging for me, too, because I'm such a square. I feel like I play in the orchestra, I do my job, I go home. But then doing outreach things like that were if you just play a familiar like Willie Nelson country song or something on bassoon and the music therapist is playing guitar, it's amazing someone who maybe has been nonverbal all week might say something or someone who hasn't physically been moving might look up. And so things like that are so beautiful and fulfilling. And at Oregon has another wonderful program, the Lullaby Project, which is through Carnegie Hall and the Oregon Symphony musicians work with local singer-songwriters and mothers, fathers, and parents-to-be at Portland Homeless Family Solutions. And we work together as a team and we create lullabies for their children. 
And initially I signed up for the program kind of thinking, all right, like, let's see what this is about. Because it, at first I thought, I don't know how this is going to be effective. Like you're homeless. Do you need a song? But we, again, worked with professionals who were trauma informed and throughout this entire, it was a months, months long process. We, you know, we created music with them, but I feel like most importantly, we created a safe space for those parents to be vulnerable. And just some of the things I witnessed while we were creating a song and empowering the mothers or fathers to choose what instruments they wanted to have in their song, we kind of auditioned for them. And instead of telling them, oh, you're going to have a bassoon, you know, like, what do you want? What kind of style of song do you want? So just seeing people um, who are not feeling well at that moment, being empowered. And it was just such a, such a beautiful process. I love that sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. yeah, we even started out the process, I think on one of the days, um, we sat down with the mothers, uh, fathers and parents to be, and they wrote a letter to their kids, just for words, just before we started even thinking about a song of what they wanted for their kids. And I don't have any children, but I would write in that situation a letter to my future children, or if I had children, what would I want for them? And it was so beautiful. We even did icebreakers around the room, which sometimes my you know realistic brain is like, icebreakers, how is that going to be effective? But there was a professional leading it who had had prior experience, and the icebreakers were actually icebreakers you know we actually got to know like little questions like when you, there was one question that stuck out in my mind where one of the questions was when your child can't sleep what do you what do you do and i paired up with this guy and he said he drove his child around in the car seat and i was like oh my gosh that's exactly what my parents would do and so we would have these moments where we could just bond over the simplest things, even though I didn't have children, but I'm like, oh my gosh, my dad did that and you as a dad are doing that for your child. It just, it became so much more than the music. You know? mm -hmm. It was such a, such a beautiful program, Lullaby Project. I feel like I love playing in the orchestra and I think in a sense we are community servants, even in the orchestra. I feel like we play music that the community needs. Mm -hmm. But outreach really takes it to that next level where we, we are community servants. Mm -hmm. you know, we're here to help the community. I don't mm -hmm. know, that's why we do this. Thank you for sharing about that, Nicole. It would be great to hear more just about your teaching philosophies and your approach to teaching music and the bassoon. Yes. So I feel like my teaching philosophies come from so much of my great prior experiences. So I'm always trying to meet the student where they are and building a solid foundation. Most importantly, while maintaining positive inner self dialogue during practice. Yes. So making sure they're having positive self talk. And I think two big components of the solid foundation being technical proficiency, your fundamental exercises, scales, long tones, if the students more advanced etudes or even the small kind of etudes in the Bisonborn bassoon method, but building that really strong building block. And then I think another really important building block, even when you're on the very early Bisonborn exercises is just the ability to make convincing musical decisions. So from day one, or even during slow practice, teaching them that, hey, just because this seems simple, making a choice to make a convincing musical decision. I don't care what the decision is, but be convincing. So, um, and with older students doing melodic etudes so that they have more musical problem solving skills in their bag, I definitely try and not tell them what to do. Sometimes if a student is stuck, I'll give them options. And maybe one of the options is just bad, <laughs> you know, but I think one thing I remember Kristen Hope Jensen 
teaching me in undergrad was you got to try every which way to figure out which way you want to do it. So that's one thing I will be in the lesson and I'll say, all right, well, you know what? I don't know. I'm just crescendo here. Okay, try that. Do you like it? Now, what if you do day crescendo? Try that. Now, which one do you like? Because it's their etude. And obviously I try and always make sure it's stylistically appropriate. <laughs> You know, so if someone's going a little too rogue, I'll bring them in. <laughs> but yes, technique, technical playing and musical playing. And then again, meeting the student where they're at. So if they are needing to do solo rep or if their heart or soul is calling them to do solo rep, trying to fit a little bit of that in there and orchestral excerpts if they're auditioning for school or youth orchestra. And really just teaching them from day one how to practice and have good rhythm. <laughs> I guess that's far from the technical <laughs> And then um, I didn't start making reads until later into my career. So I try to tell my students that if they are feeling behind with it, that they have plenty of time. So I will definitely in high school start meeting the student with what they need with reads or read making principles. I even have had a few very adventurous and daring middle school students who are like, tell me about this read thing, you know, so we will talk about read making principles in a very concrete way, just not watered down, you know, but pitch response and, you know, just tell it like it is because they can understand it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips or advice on coping with music performance anxiety, if that's something you've experienced? Oh my gosh, every day of my life, <laughs> right now. Yeah. So, oh my gosh, so many tips. Oh, well, I don't know if they're tips, but coping mechanisms. Uh -huh. I think just preparing as much as humanly possible. Score studying. Oh, I think about if I'm playing in the orchestra. Things I would do would, yes, be score studying, hmm. listening to multiple recordings and playing along with multiple recordings. And also if I'm listening to recording with my part, if I get lost, oh my gosh, check the score. And just so much preparation so that you're like foolproof. Um, that is always a good feeling and having good reads, knowing they're going to work. Huh, good reads. It's that. But <laughs> and also um, mental training. Um, one app I will pay for the yearly subscription for Headspace. Wow. And that's helpful for me. Um, even just quick little mental tricks when I'm in the orchestra, like remembering where my feet are on the ground. That's one thing Ben Hammonds would always frequently say and then an alexander technique principle of you know my head is light and then it's just like upward also positive affirmations it's amazing i witnessed a french horn master class at rice while i was at rice and um bill vermulen had the horn players play i don't know maybe an excerpt and then he had them stand up in their chair and say, you know, my name is Nicole Haywood and I play the French horn. And then they sat down and they played the excerpt again. And yes. everyone played better. So this is kind of a crazy, insane thing, but frequently before auditions or even before a concert, if I'm having a negative thought come into my brain, I'm like, no, I'm Nicole Haywood and I play second bassoon, you know, or I'm this or I'm that, whatever I am in that moment. So. Yeah, an affirmation. Encountering a negative thought with a positive affirmation. If you're feeling scared or doubtful, being like, no, I am triumphant or something. So just, oh, so much mental training. And then I feel like this is something that has to be addressed. I'm not a medical professional by any means, but um, if you are dealing with so many physical symptoms with shaking, talking to your doctor, because a lot of people do use beta blockers in the orchestra for concertos, auditions. So again, talk to your doctor if you're having physical symptoms that are really getting in the way of your playing. 
The one thing about beta blockers is they don't address any of those negative thoughts. So you could be as calm as a cucumber and still hating yourself inside. Yes. So you just, you've got to do the work. You have to do the inner work at the end of the day. And it gets easier, I feel like, the more you play. But I, one of my uh, bassoon friends, I was talking to him about being nervous, and he said something about you have to make friends with your performance anxiety, realizing like for me personally, it's never going to go away, you know? So it's just my friend, you know? Oh, oh great. You know, Fred is here right now or something. <laughs> so I'm just thinking I'm best friends with him. <laughs> I love that advice, Nicole. It's like, come on, here we go. Yeah, right? <laughs> and you and get us, you know what? Yeah, we're like, I, I'm excited getting on stage, you know? I wouldn't be a little bit nervous. I mean, at Grant Park, sometimes there's, I mean, I think of it, there's thousands of people at concerts, or we're also live on the radio, and you're like, of course you're feeling something. You'd be dead if you weren't feeling anything, so. Mm -hmm. Are there any music-related injuries that you could share with us about? Oh my gosh, yes. I, I saw this question and I thought it was just, maybe hilarious is the wrong word, but we had talked about a few months ago and I was like, oh man, I've never had a performance injury. And then it happened. I woke up one morning and I was just having burning down my neck. I couldn't move my head to the left. Mm. Eventually that turned into numbness and tingling down the pinky and my ring finger, senses of cold down my hand. And it took about two weeks actually until I really started talking to people about it. So my best advice would be when you're feeling that, oh my gosh, talk to friends that have had a similar injury and I got into physical therapy as soon as possible after that. And <laughs> I think it's some combination of music related injury. I've been practicing a lot, but I also work out a lot. And uh -huh. I think I wasn't stretching and mm -hmm. wasn't taking care of my body as much, but I got into physical therapy and massages, chiropractic care. I tried everything. Up. Right. Actually, strangely enough, a friend had suggested acupuncture. I've never done acupuncture in my life. Mm -hmm. And at the tail end, I was fine. I was getting better and better and better and better, but I just wasn't completely there back to 100% yet. And then I did acupuncture and I did three treatments. Wow. Three weeks back to back. And it's so much better. It's wow. amazing. So just, it's, you know, it's very humbling. Because just a few months ago, I was like, ah, I've never been injured. And then, oh my gosh, it was, it seems soul crushing. I, I definitely, it's so good to have a network of friends. And my parents are wonderful. They'll listen to me, um, you know, because you, when you want to practice, but you physically can't, it yes. uh, really is soul crushing to say uh -huh. the least. But mm -hmm. as remembering to stretch and take care of your body and just ask for help. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I think that's um, getting to talk about this, Nicole. It's so wonderful because, yeah, things happen, and yeah. and and too, just like through exercise, you know, even like rolling your foot or pulling yeah. something, and it does affect so many yes. different other aspects of life. Uh, yeah. and, and it was so <laughs> yeah, so humbling because as someone that works out a lot, I couldn't. Uh, well, like I could still shoulder press and I could clean and press and things like that. I could do it, but it was aggravating my injury. So it was so humbling. I still went to the gym because I just need to move my body. And I work at an Orange Theory Fitness, which is basically a prescribed workout each day. So I would go and I had to tell all of my coaches I was injured, you know, and that made me sad at first and then I realized no they're there to help me and but it was still so humbling having to pick up the five pound weights or something realizing that I can't do what I used to be able to do and what a privilege it is to be able to move my body in those ways and through the process of building back strength and being able to do more with my upper body oh my gosh it feels so good but it uh, I don't take it for granted anymore mm. now I'm like wow I'm lucky 
to be able to move my body like this. Is there any advice that you can share for musicians just starting out their music careers? Uh, yes, advice. I feel like one thing Ben Kamins would always say was you have to love the work. Mm. And I think that is very true. You have, you have to love the process, the practicing, because I feel like this career can be kind of relentless at times, unforgiving, mm. you know, so having patience and grace with yourself during, during this career. And there's one quote that comes to mind mm. in uh, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, mm. who's a, a, in a concentration camp and survived. And he, one quote that I loved out of that book was, those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. And so it's like, if you have a why of why you want to play the bassoon, you can bear with like almost any failure, you know, moving to a new city and not having friends in the city or moving away from family or friends. And, you know, this career is amazing, but it's, it's hard. You know, so if you have, have a why here, you can do it. That's beautiful advice, Nicole. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to interview you. And it's so wonderful to get a glimpse into your life and your career as a professional musician. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for having me, Julie. For everyone tuning in, keep an eye out for two events held every week on the Music Link. Every Thursday Central Daylight Time, a new YouTube video launches, and every Sunday Central Daylight Time is a live Zoom group discussion session with a great new guest every week that you can register for on the website. Check out Nicole's hosting session coming up this Sunday, Central Daylight Time, where she's sharing about the importance of movement as a musician, distinguishing between playing to live and living to play, what makes a good orchestra friend and colleague, and so much more. Find out more about Nicole and her work on her website at NicoleBassoon.com and feel free to reach out to her anytime she would love to hear from you. Please like, comment, and share any questions or feedback in the section below, and we'd be happy to incorporate these in the live discussion. Please subscribe to this channel and turn on the bell for notifications, which really helps keep the Music Link moving forward. The Music Link is a New Zealand-based resource for people around the world to share, learn, and connect through music. Thank you for watching, and I'll see y'all in the next video.